Hello and welcome to my easy to understand guide to the Daily Mail newspaper and industry. This video is going to be particularly relevant for you if you are studying AQA A-level media studies as the Daily Mail is currently a set text on the A-level specification. Please be aware that this video contains some references to Daily Mail content over the years that some people may find upsetting, including references and images of articles that could be considered homophobic, anti-Semitic and supportive of the Nazi party. The Daily Mail is um, owned and published by the Daily Mail and General Trust. Uh, so that's what the company is called, which is often shortened to DMGT. The company is very, very old. The newspaper has been going since 1896. So very historical company and product. The current chairman of the company is Jonathan Harmsworth. Um, he is a Viscount um, and he is a relative of the original founders of the newspaper. So the newspaper has stayed within a family organisation for over a hundred years. Viscount's obviously kind of a title, which means that the family comes from wealth, um, and a kind of quite middle to high class background. DMGT is a very big company. It brings in around two billion pounds of revenue every single year and it operates across a wide range of media industries. It's diversified into things like not just newspapers, but also property, investments and events as well. So working across a wide range of industries in order to maximise profits. They also operate in 40 countries around the world, so quite a global company too. As well as the Daily Mail, the company is horizontally integrated. They do make a range of other print products, including uh, the I newspaper, the Metro newspaper and New Scientist as well. So, um, you know, a range of print products and a range of other products and events and industries that they uh, work into. Now, the print circulation of newspapers has been in heavy decline in general over the last 20 years. Lots of readers now are going online for their news. They don't want to pay for it. And so newspaper circulation massively declining um, and the Daily Mail is doing OK. The Daily Mail is uh, getting 1.1 million um, circulation daily. So the daily kind of sales of 1.1 of million, uh, which means their readership is about 2.1 million on average two people read each newspaper um, and in terms of their website which they also have uh, they're getting a huge huge number of people visiting it 218 million unique users every month which is massive the Mail Online is the most visited newspaper website in the world so their website is doing unbelievably well now, that's great for the Daily Mail, obviously, because with print circulations declining in general, they need to get their advertising revenue somewhere else. A lot of brands no longer wanting to place adverts in printed papers. So having the website allows them to open up other avenues for that advertising revenue. So they will allow companies to place things like banner ads. They'll have takeovers of the page. So the ads are kind of all around the place. Sponsored content as well uh, to run competitions and things like that so lots of ways that website opens up for them to earn more profit the daily mail has won a number of awards in the last 10 or 15 years in fact it's won national newspaper of the year eight times in 17 years which is you know obviously a lot uh, it does suggest that the paper has a really big audience and that it still is a very popular paper the Daily Mail has its own team of editors and journalists there to write stories, find stories. They will also purchase stories from other places. So if there are stories that are happening elsewhere that perhaps they didn't get to first, they may well um, syndicate those stories onto their website or into their paper. Um, so having that kind of financial ability to be able to do that. Likewise, they can also syndicate their stories to other sources as well. So perhaps if another website or another paper wants to purchase a story, a photograph, a graphic, anything from the Daily Mail that the Daily Mail owns, then they can pay the DMGT for use of that story. And that's another great way of making profit as well. They also invite their readers to submit stories, so encouraging interactivity with the audiences um, and that helps them obviously at a cheaper price potentially get hold of stories quicker. 
the Mail Online is free to access. Um, some newspapers are charging for online content now, but the Mail does not. And perhaps that's why it is so popular. It also has a free app that people can download as well. Uh, and there are no in-app purchases on there at all. So but again, potentially why the app itself is very popular too. The app also opens up a range of other advertising as well. If you attempt to use their app, adverts will pop up and play videos that you can't skip. It's very annoying, but obviously a way of making them extra money. DMGT actually set up another website and app called Mail Plus, which is much less known than Mail Online. Mail Plus is a kind of premium access website that you can pay um, as well as an app you can pay for. And it will basically produce more exclusive content for you, um, original stories, but it is also advert free. So if you do want an ad free experience, you can pay to get it on Mail Plus, but it is definitely not as successful successful as the Mail Online website. So for example, the Mail Online website, I said, um, you know, receives 218 million unique users a month. The Mail Plus site is only getting 34,000. So um, really a sign that people don't want to pay. They would rather sit through the free adverts. Um, as long as the news is free. Now, DMGT uh, is a conservative company and therefore the Daily Mail is a conservative supporting newspaper. Uh, in general, they will, um, and you see this in their paper and on their website and their social media, they will often write articles that clearly are politically against Labour and the Lib Dems and much more pro-conservatives, but also not just the actual Conservative Party, pro-conservative ideology. So perhaps more pro-Trump or pro-Republican um, or pro other more right wing political parties in the UK, such as UKIP. This has got them in trouble sometimes in the past. So um, in historically, the company back in 1940s, uh, 1930s and 1940s, um, actually was pro-Nazi, if you can believe it. Uh, they wrote very positive stories about Hitler and the Nazi party. Um, and that is potentially because the owners of the magazine felt that their political ideologies matched up with that of the Nazi party. So the impact of the actual owners of the magazine coming through sometimes in the articles in the paper themselves. Their pro-Nazi stance is not the only controversy that the Daily Mail has uh, come across in their time and been responsible for. I could probably be here forever if I read them out, um, but just a few of them here so that you can see them. In 2009, they came under scrutiny for writing quite a homophobic and insensitive article about the death of Stephen Gately, who was a Boyzone singer at the time. In fact, the Press Complaints Commission got 25,000 complaints from people and advertisers actually pulled their ads from the online article about Stephen Gately because they were so worried about the bad publicity from this. In 2013, they wrote a, an anti-Semitic article about Ed Miliband's father and they got in quite a lot of trouble for that as well. In 2015, an ex-member of the Daily Mail reporting staff actually wrote an expose article about the Daily Mail's journalistic techniques. So, for example, said that they often copied material from other news, resort, news sources and never credited them. So a way of kind of um, getting cheap articles and never giving credit to the people who'd actually written them. He also said that they were very, very happy to uh, create false newspaper reports for publicity and drama and excitement. 2017 they did a front cover about a man that had been arrested stating clearly that he'd had a bomb. Uh, he did not have a bomb and Ipso actually ordered them to correct this because they felt that it was libel against the man in question. Uh, in 2019 Meghan Markle sued them for libel as well for making statements about her and her family um, and also for reporting on letters that her father had sold to the newspaper. In 2017 Melania Trump sued the Daily Mail successfully over a story where they suggested that she previously worked as an escort 
And in 2015, the Daily Mail got into some controversy for trying to buy footage of a terrorist attack, despite the police trying to keep the footage um, under wraps for their investigation. So, you know, several controversies, all of which really seem to demonstrate the fact that newspapers, including the Daily Mail, will often breach the regulations set out by companies like Ipso and Impress and previously the PCC because they know that they can afford the fines and that actually the risks are worth it. Printing an article that is very sensationalist or very racist or homophobic or libelous it might get them a fine, but at the end of the day, it's also going to get them a huge number of readers. So a lot of these newspapers, including the Daily Mail, will often take those risks in order to sensationalise their content and hopefully attract more readers. And the only time that that ever really stops them is if their advertisers start to pull out. Once advertisers and brands start to withdraw their advertising revenue, uh, that is when the Daily Mail will often step in and apologise. So it seems that in terms of regulation, companies like PCC previously and Ipso now have very little effect or impact on the DMGT. Um, and actually, it's advertisers that hold more power for them. The Daily Mail have a great way of targeting a range of audiences around the world. So, for example, as well as the actually Daily Mail in England, they have a separate Scottish version um, to which has different columnists and different articles in it. And you will sometimes see, and I'll show some on the screen side by side now, different articles on the same day that show a very clear difference in the in the way they're targeting audiences because they know that English audiences and Scottish audiences might feel differently about the same story. They also have an Irish version, they have an Indian version, there is also a kind of general world mail that is often offered around uh, in other countries as well. So a range of different versions of the Daily Mail in order to target different audiences in other countries. The DMGT have formed partnerships with several other companies over the years in order to benefit both companies. So synergetic partnerships, for example, with the People's Daily. The People's Daily is the official newspaper of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and the reason that the DMGT did this was so that they could get exclusive access to news stories from, with, from within China. Now, don't forget that the news and the media is heavily censored and controlled within China. So getting exclusive exclusive access to some of this content would give them a bit of a unique um, brand in the UK. It might make them stand out getting exclusive content. Um, however, it also got several complaints. A lot of people felt that it meant that they wouldn't accurately um, and objectively report on things like Chinese politics as a result. In 2017, they worked with a company called Stage 29 Productions to launch Daily Mail TV. So launching their own TV channel in order, again, to promote their brand and also to um, to really encourage a global audience as well. There is a huge audience of more kind of conservative or right wing uh, people, especially within America. So really trying to target those with video based content is a great way of drawing them back onto your website. One way that the DMGT have really tried to promote the Daily Mail brand is by promoting the way the Daily Mail have gotten involved with national campaigns. So, for example, during the COVID pandemic, the Daily Mail started a campaign to try and get safe PPE for NHS staff. So things like masks and gloves and respirators, etc. Um, and the Daily Mail was quite key in starting this campaign, encouraging fundraising, organising, um, you know, petitions and things like that. Um, and that resulted in more protective equipment being given to the NHS. And the Daily Mail heavily promoted this on their website and through their other avenues, through their other media products as well. Um, and this obviously creates this idea that the Daily Mail is kind of pro-Britain and that it has got a real, it makes people feel as though they're doing something good for the country. So it's a great way of promoting the newspaper to people who uh, want to feel very patriotic about their country. The DMGT obviously use social media a lot to promote the Daily Mail, targeting those modern online audiences. So use of things like Facebook and Twitter to draw in audiences, to redirect them back to the website all the time, trying to drive traffic to the website, 
in an attempt to make more money from advertising. Social media, obviously, again, a very good way of targeting a global audience and encouraging people to share your content to other people. You can see that both on their website and on social media, they create these little thumbnail images with kind of very, very simplified headlines that act as clickbait. These clickbait images and articles are designed to make people uh, feel shocked or interested, intrigued. They are sometimes very sensationalised in an attempt to make people click on them. Their website and their social media pages bring further problems to do with regulation. They do use human moderators and also algorithmic moderation as well on their website. And that helps to detect things like racism, homophobia, transphobia, etc. However, it is definitely not perfect. And a lot of comments get through that are very clearly breaching the guidelines set out by things such as Ipso. A lot of this content is very extreme and very offensive. You can see some examples on screen at the moment of real comments left by real readers of the Daily Mail on some of their articles about things such as LGBTQ issues, Hitler, etc. That would clearly be very offensive to a lot of people. Social media, obviously, is potentially even worse in terms of regulation. They have less control over it, the Daily Mail, and social media, of course, does not have an official regulatory body. So it means that even more comments get through and are publicly visible on their Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages. It's worth considering whether the Daily Mail would censor or delete these comments, even if they could. There are some benefits for them. You know, all, all publicity is good publicity, even the bad. So um, when they do have very shocking comments like this and it does get shared online, um, it, it still acts as good publicity for them. It's also allowing their readers to express themselves, even if those expressions are offensive. So um, I, I suppose it does please a lot of their readers to be able to um, express their feelings like this. So the Daily Mail does have some reasons as to why it might allow this content to slip through their moderation, uh, even if it might be a little bit accidentally on purpose. So that was my easy to understand guide to the Daily Mail newspaper and industry. Don't forget to check out my channel for other videos that are going to be relevant for you, including videos on keywords, set texts and set theorists. If there are any videos that you would like that I don't already have, please leave a little comment below and I'll see what I can do.